Okay. OP345. We started the encapsulation, right? Encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. And we said encapsulation is? Um, com uh, integration between logic and data. Right, integration between logic and data, which also enforces? Uh, Purin. Privacy, yeah. yes. So privacy uh, encourage, uh, it enforces privacy. Uh, that's encapsulation. And putting the data and behavior together. Right? So that's what we dealt with. Now, we said inheritance and object orientation is to? To um, uh, get all the features of the? Previously existing previously, class, yeah. which essentially means? Using? Um, code. Code. Reusing code. So essentially, it means reusing code. So, um, but it's not only code. We are actually reusing what? We are reusing design. She's really mad at me because I wasn't at Tim Hortons when I said so. Was so. <laughs> That's what so. Anyway, so yeah, so uh, uh, reusing design, and that's inheritance. So essentially, with inheritance, we reuse design. We use an already existing design, and we make new classes out of it. And therefore, we can actually reuse our design, and we don't have to keep doing the things that we have done before. And one of the major re major uh, uh, poles and bases of object orientation other than encapsulation and inheritance is? Pass. Is pass. Is? Polymorphism. Polymorphism, which is? Different shape. Different shape, which means? Pass. Which means? Pass. Which means? Multiple behavior of a function. Multiple behavior of a function is one of the things, right? So we said that they're different to like, at the end of the class, I think, um, anyways, so this is three, four, five, right? Okay, good. For a second, I thought I'm a two, so, so you need to, you, sh you should know this. So polymorphism has four different, two major categories, and those two major categories of polymorphism are? Pair of something, I, I forgot. Pair of something? <laughs> that's a parasite, and it comes under that. Is? <laughs> yes. Parametric. No, parametric is, we have two different types of two major. If you talk about polymorphism, we are actually dividing it in two major oh, categories. Ad hoc and? Ad -hoc and I don't remember the other one. Ad hoc and? Ad hoc and? Universal, right? Universal poly and ad hoc. Okay, so when we are dealing with ad hoc polymorphism, we said ad hoc polymorphism essentially means it is a type of? Fake polymorphism. Ad hoc is actually fake. It's not really polymorphism. It actually tries to imitate polymorphism, and like casting, like uh, function overloading. And we said function overloading is not really polymorphism because the names of the functions are uh, are modified using the the the, the, the types that, that are in the prototype. Therefore, they're different names. They are not the same functions. They're actually two different functions. Where we talked about universal polymorphism and universal polymorphism, we have two different types of things. You remember any of those? Pass. Universal. Studios. Pass. No? <laughs> you have to tell me. No. What is the question? <laughs> Who was Pierre Elliott Trudeau? Oh, no, I'm just <laughs> no, uh, universal polymorphism. <coughs> there are two different types of universal polymorphism. Give me one of them and here, here, here. Oh, uh, OK, so one is fake polymorphism? Well, that was ad hoc. Yeah. Then we said universal polymorphism has two different types. Is that parameter? Pa parametric polymorphism. And the other one was? And the other was? In? Okay, good. All right. All right, so uh, with parametric polymorphism, we are essentially talking about templates, which means you, you set the logic and the compiler decides to rewrite the code for you uh, as it compiles the code based on the usage that you're doing. So that's a pretty cool type of polymorphism. You don't even create the class. So when you create a template out of a, a, a class template, if you don't use it, literally, the compiler won't generate anything for you. That's how polymorphic it is. It could be nothing if you don't use it. 
But if you use it, it's going to make sure that the logic is transformed the way you are using it. And inclusion polymorphism was the one that it was picking the right action based on the hierarchy of inheritance. Remember that? It would actually, like the, 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 uh, the children of a class would have the same method as the other one. If the method was virtual, then it would pick up the right one, the latest version. So virtualism essentially was... Like if, I, if you go to uh, an interview and you ask, uh, somebody tells you what is a virtual function, you would say it is? It's not currently defined, but can be. That's pure virtual function. Yeah. But what is virtuality? Virtuality guarantees that? Yes. Guarantees that you pass. Essentially, it guarantees that the latest version of the function is always called. That's what virtuality is. And virtuality only kicks in when there is inheritance. When you don't have inheritance, virtuality doesn't mean anything. Okay? So virtuality only kicks in. Attention. Attention. Achtung. Listen to me. Virtuality only kicks in when you have a child pointed by a parent's reference or pointer. Otherwise, virtuality means nothing. Virtuality only kicks in if you call me Mr. Soleiman Lu, teach, then if I was my father, I would have taught mechanics. But because I changed the teaching function of my father, I'm teaching computers. If the teaching of mine was not virtual, you called Mr. Soleiman Lu, teach, I would have taught you mechanics. But because my teaching is virtual, the latest version of my teaching is called, which is for that teaching, computer science. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay? Yes. The, the latest one. The latest in the hierarchy. The grandparent is the first, then their parents, then their children and the grandchildren. So if they're all the way, the same function is all the way implemented, the grandchilds will be called. If it's implemented. Exactly. Bad example, but hey. So that's that. We talked about modularity. We understand what modularity is. Modularity is essentially um, our way of putting things that are related in each other in a file. And we call it a module. And when you're dealing with modules, essentially you're uh, dealing with uh, uh, when we talked about it, we said we're going to put one class in a file. And we said a class is a CPP file, and the specifications of the class, and the declarative definition, and all the stuff goes to the header file. Why everybody's looking at me as, like, as if like, you just walked into C++? Remember what modularity was? Anybody knows what, what the module is? Module is a separate unit that one class is implemented in or all the classes who are closely re related with each other. Menu and menu item, remember that? Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away? No? No? Remember? All right. So uh, the building blocks of uh, when we are dealing with C language or values, where essential literal values that you put in a, in a thing, you can, like when you write actually 12. OK? So that's an unsigned integer 12. Right? Those are the ones. You have objects. Objects are essentially instances of things. All right? So if I have an integer as a class, i is the object, integer is the class. Are we okay with this? Variables are these. Okay, variables are kind of uh, object with a name, right? Okay? And what are references? What is a reference in C language? C++. When I say C, it means C++, right? You add the plus plus to it. Okay, let me go someplace that is... What is a reference, my dear? Reference, address of... Um... It's implemented by an address that's behind the scene, but really, what is it? What is a reference? Um, pass, I guess. A, a what? Pass. Uh, is an uh, like an example to... Okay. <coughs> okay. Please use your opera voice when you're answering me. La, la, la. Be loud, OK? Don't answer like this, because I cannot hear you. And nobody can. You have to be loud, OK? So reference is a 
essentially a is uh, address and address um, no not address I think also address no somebody said you said what alias, alias. an address is an address. A reference is implemented using an address behind the scene. My name is Farad, call me Freddy. Okay? Freddy is my reference, not my address. When I tell you Freddy, you don't see where Farad is. You just know if you call Freddy, Farad's gonna come to you. And you say Farad, Freddy's gonna come to you. Potatoes, potatoes, right? Potatoes, potatoes. Potato is one reference, potato is another reference. They both refer to the same, is it a fruit? What is it? <laughs> vegetable to same unhealthy thing that you can eat and get fat anyway so so those are references that we dealt with it was like the answer of C++ to the rookie programmers do, who, who hated to deal with addresses and it actually has lots of good side effects too okay we had functions if you don't know what a function is go quit right now okay <laughs> take IPC 144 we're not talking about those and the, one of the most important things, types. So essentially, a location of memory is defined to act in a certain way using a type. When you say integer i, it means a piece of memory is designated to act like an integer. And you use it, and that becomes a type. Types can be primitive, or it can be, they can be Compound types. Compound type is essentially a type that is built up of not only primitive, other types. Yes, other types. It could be like I could have an employee that has a name and an employee number, and name is a class that has a first and a last. So a compound type can be built up of other compound types. Uh, we have class members. We have templates. Templates, you know what templates are, right? We know what templates are, and most importantly, namespaces. What are the namespaces? Anybody remembers what the namespace is? Do you remember what the namespace is? Namespace is a class. class. It's not a class. It's, it's a, scope. a so scope. Thank scope. you. It's yeah. a scope to, yeah. to, to prevent what? Why do, we, why do we have namespaces? To prevent? Conflicting names. Conflicting names. That's right. That's right. Because when you're designing a big system, you're going to have different abstractions of the same uh, thing. When I say different abstractions, what do you mean abstraction? Do you remember what abstraction is? No. Abstraction. Anybody knows what abstract data is? Like somebody writes, like draws something and it says an abstract portrait. When you look at it, you see, see some mishmash thing and it says, that's a beautiful woman. Okay, I, say, I don't see that. Oh, it's an abstract art. Okay, what does it mean then abstract? Abstract means to take pieces that you want and throw away what you don't. That's an abstract thing. So abstraction, when I say different abstractions of the same thing, I am dealing with a car as a salesperson. The price of the car is important to me. It, it's important what is the warranty and all that, yada, yada, yada. But if I want to look at the car as a mechanic, it's the make and a model that is extremely important for me, that the type of the engine and like the parts and things like that. When a salesperson is selling the car, it doesn't, he doesn't care that what kind of a spark plug is going to go in there, right? Or whatever battery is going to get fit in. You don't care about those things. But when you're a mechanic, you so a car can, can be, uh, the same class car can be designed in two different ways with two different aspects. For that, we have namespaces. Each namespace holds the abstractions of the things that you want the way you want them. So if you redesign the classes, it's got to be mechanics, scope resolution car, or dealership scope resolution car. <laughs> okay? There are two cars in two different names, namespaces, and that prevents name collisions. Are we okay with this? All right? I'll try to be as quick as possible to get rid of all these basics so we can actually get into what we want. We talked about fundamental types, built-in types, and user-defined types. Uh, with fundamental types, what do we mean? A fundamental type is a type that you, if you remove the language, the type still exists. That's a fundamental type. That's, that means what your CPU understands as a type, the hardware. That's a fundamental type, okay? But when language kicks in, 
it can actually add more types which get translated to build different types of types on the on the uh, uh, on a hardware uh, Uh, a scope that we're going to talk about uh, in detail. When we are talking about scope, essentially, when we are dealing with a scope, what do we mean? What, what, how many different types of scopes you know? First of all, what is a scope? A scope is a block in which th things are visible. And when you go out of the block, the things are not visible anymore. Are we okay with that? Now, when you think about it, how many different types of scopes we have dealt with? We had regular scopes, like you write an if statement, you open a curly bracket. And if you define something and then close the curly bracket, as soon as the if statement is over, variable is gone. Right? And then we have other types, like we have functions. You put uh, a variable inside a function, and when the function is over, it's gone. Right? And then you have a file. You go at the top of the file. You write something at the top in the scope. So all the functions in that file can see that variable. But when you get out of it, you go to another module. The variable is not visible anymore. That's the file scope, right? And then you create a, a member variable inside a class. And it's visible to all members of that class, no matter which file they are in. And that's a class scope, correct? And finally, we have two beautiful objects that you have used a lot, C in and C out. What is C in? Awesome. Ice cream. I know, but what is it? Oh, um, pass. Oh, come on, don't be lazy. Answer. What is, what is, what is it, console in? What was, what, what was the question? <laughs> what is C in? Console in. Console in, what does it mean? It's the object of the studio input output library. No, 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 not studio input output library. C in, I said. What did you say? Output. Did you ever output something on C in, you bad boy? <laughs> no. Okay, C in is an instance of the class that receives stuff that is? I stream. Thank you, it's I stream. So C in is an instance of I stream. Okay? C out is an instance of? O stream, right? But as soon as you include IO stream over there, have you ever had to create C in? Did you ever say I stream C in? No, it's created for you. So the object is already created for you and it's, and it's available everywhere. That is a global object. Global objects are usually created because in the logic of the environment, they are unique and they are accessible to everyone. Console is something that is there. You cannot not have the console, right? And there is only one. You, you don't have like three consoles. It's one console. One keyboard information comes in, one console key information goes out. That's why you, they don't let you to actually instantiate it. The constructor of iStream and OStream, they are private. You cannot actually instantiate them. They do it in a tricksy way by themselves so you don't have to, so you don't create another one out of them. Because they don't want the, because you're on C out, you're printing something and the cursor moves. And cursor has a coordinate on a screen, right? If you create two C outs, then which cursor goes what? Right? Because of that, they make it unique and because of that, make it global. So those are the scopes. Now, these uh, global scopes and local scopes are, are done using linkages. So essentially, when you create a linkage through linkages, you can make something be very acceptable externally to another module. We call that external linkage. We have internal linkage, which essentially means in one module, one thing has access to the other one. OK, you put a prototype at the top, and you see what is what. OK? And uh, you have no linkage when you have only one module. <clears throat> I'm actually literally going through this. Is it helpful if I bring this up and you'll see it? <clears throat> so I'm just going through these. All right? Compile time, link time, and run time. OK. Did I bring the picture of the compilation thingy in this class? I, sh I should have recorded it. I didn't. Let me see if I can find it again. Let me pause the recording so 
my search to find the thing is not recorded over here. And whenever I resume, all right. So we talked about these things. So we have, so let's look at this. So we have compile time, link time, and run time. Compile time happens in, so, 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 question, 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 question. If I write this command on, uh, on my, on matrix, if, no, not that command, this command. If I write something like this, if I write, what is the command to, to compile? It's G++, is it, is it the one? G++, okay, G++, ab.cpp, cd.cpp, and main.cpp. And I hit enter. How many times the compiler is going to run? Three times, okay, that's a beautiful act question for the next quiz, actually, right? So, actually, I, I, let me open the thing and put it over here so I can actually note it down. Where is it? Again, Paul, next time. So that's going to be called three times, and we know that. So when we look at this now, let me take this to the other screen so it's more handy. Okay, so <clears throat> when we talk about compile time, it means what happens when every individual file is being compiled over here? The defiant statements, the includes you put over there, the, the compilation directives you put over there, the if defined thingies you put over there. All those things, these are all compile times. Like if you actually create a variable, uh, let's say an array of 500 integers, okay? If you create an array of 500 integers, then those 500 integers will get actually occupied inside your executable, in what we call a stack area. It's gonna get in at compile time. It's not going to ask the operating system when the system is running. It's going to be there right at that moment. So that's compile time. Now, the next thing that we need to know is link time. What happens in link time? In link time, that's the time that you actually say, I have a function in that module, and I'm using it here. So module A is using module B for whatever reason. There is a class over there. There is whatever. Okay, so you are using C out and you included IO stream. To actually see if C out exists over there at link time, it verifies that linkage between modules. So that's the link time. And finally, when everything is over, execution times come through. That's the time that you do int pointer A is equal to new int 5. That's at runtime. That's when compiler actually runs and requests operating system at the moment of execution to give me five integers. All right? So these are the three crucial times that we need to understand, and in our coding, we need to actually use that to our advantage. Which one is used when? And so what do we do to, like, if I, if I create, like, if I create uh, an array of 5,000 integers, What's going to happen? It's going to make my executable bigger. It's going to use more stack. What, what happens if I make it dynamic? Then it's going to go to runtime. The executable is going to be smaller. But then it's going to use heap, and it's going to use more memory at runtime. And you have to have more memory available when you're running it. OK? So a program with runtime stuff may execute and crash halfway through. A program with compile time stuff or link, link time stuff may not even get executed if it's too big. You follow what I'm saying? OK? So we have to go through all these things in detail. And we are going to, and you'll see. So just appreciate these three times, these three uh, uh, crucial times in, in, in programming. Uh, statically and dynamically, anything essentially that is static is happening during, uh, uh, during any statically alloc When I say static, I don't mean the keyword static. Statically allocated means integer A500. Okay? Dynamically allocated means integer pointer A is equal to new int 500. One is dynamically allocated, the other one is statically allocated. You look, you look like a question mark. Was it okay? 
Am I going too fast? <clears throat> One thing that I forgot to tell you, uh, when I get excited, I speak too fast. <laughs> OK? <laughs> uh, slow me down. Say, for that, slow down. And I'm going to slow down, OK? So one more time, let me actually write it down. I, because we well, I assume that you went through all these things in OP244, so that's why I'm going, it, going like, like crazy. But, but let me actually, so, so if I write over here integer, integer a 500, OK? When compiler compiles, it's going to put that 500 integers within my executable. That's statically allocated memory. It's always 500. It cannot be 400. It's not going to go up and down. OK? If I say integer pointer b is set to new int 500, that's going to happen in runtime. It's not going to add. It's just going to add four bytes to, to my executable. Why? Why four bytes? That's the size of a pointer, right? So b, that is four bytes. That's going to be it. But at runtime, it's going to actually ask the operating system to give me 500 integers. And those 500 integers are going to be in the heap, right? Not in the <clears throat> stack. So, yeah. These are all like, <clears throat> it's all, it's, this comes exactly what I told you, like code segments, stow the program instructions. <clears throat> so what kind of it, data do we have, really, OK? So when you are looking at your program, everything that you have in a computer is data, right? There's no, nothing other than data. Some of the data, let's say we are talking about, again, instructions of baking a cake, OK? What you are writing over there, the instructions to write cake is the data. But if you say, I want five scoops of flour, that's the data that is coming from outside, OK? So what is real data, the other one is data that is using. It's the same thing over here. When you write instructions for a program, the instructions you are writing are data in memory. Those are code segments, segments of data that is actually being fed to the CPU. Inside those code segments, you can create variables. That becomes the data segments inside your code, which actually happens at compile time. Then you're going to have stack segments, which stores the data statically allocated inside the thing. So if you actually, with new, uh, in new versions of C and C++, you can actually have a variable when you are creating uh, an array. You can actually have something like this. Don't do it. Don't do it. But just know that it exists. You can actually have this. So you can, you could have integer i, then you go c in i, and then you have integer i. You could have something like this. Okay. Right. It's going to give me an error now, but you could have something like that in C language. How does it account? Is it a dynamic thing? No. It is actually, it's going to use the stack. What is a stack? Stack is the memory that the CPU gives to a program for its running crib sheet. So when, you are pro when your application is running, it needs some place to do these calculations. Well, what is the next address? Where do I go? Which function is coming from? So it needs to have some places. It's a stack that grows. You don't know what the stack is right now, but it's essentially a pile of information that you can add. Now, though you could do such a thing. I know it sounds like, duh, well, how is it possible? But you could do that. But that uses the stack memory. And it's easily overflow, o over, uh, it easily, uh, um, overflows because it's the memory designated for dirty work of your executable. That's why we use dynamically uh, allocated memory. And we are not going to do something like that. So the heap segment is the place where you actually have your dynamic memory allocation uh, uh, 
you, uh, your dynamically al allocated mem uh, memory placed into. That's heap. Uh, you have seen the slides for dynamic, oh no, you haven't. Um, this is a good place to, um, to kind of have a quick review of dynamic memory allocation. Now, let me just do this. All right. So, as I was mentioning, when you actually create an integer like that, the integer, that the, when you create an array like that, it actually goes within the body of your executable. So that, red, that green thingy that you see, that is your executable. So when you write integer A5, the whole array and pointer and everything are inside your executable program. But when you do dynamic memory allocation, this is what happens. So you only have the pointer over there, but the five integers you requested during runtime will be allocated somewhere outside of your executable, the place that everybody shares. This helps your program uh, to manage memory dynamically, and you don't have to know exactly how many things you want at compile time. You can always resize the memory as you are accessing it. So, Whenever you create a pointer, that pointer must have an address in it. If you use the pointer before you do initialize it to a piece of memory, you are going to a rogue address, an address that is not designated for you. Therefore, it's going to crash your program. And that causes what we call segmentation fault. Segmentation fault is something they, everybody calls it because that's the error message that comes up in Linux environment. It essentially means you're out of your segment. And that core dump thingy that you see over there is a segmentation fault, core dumped. What it does, it actually gets a snapshot of memory and saves it into a file. So you can go into the memory and, and uh, uh, debug it and see what went wrong. Another thing that you may do, and it's a mistake, is to create uh, a, a pointer and set it to null and then try to access, access it. When you set something to null, it means it points nowhere, to nowhere. And then you say from nowhere to go somewhere, it doesn't make sense. An address is always a number. It starts from 952, then you say go three bytes further. It becomes 955, right? If you have no, it means nowhere, no address. From no address, you cannot go anywhere. Therefore, that's wrong. Another thing that you can do is exceed the size of the memory that you create. So you have to always make sure that you're staying within the size of the memory that you are creating. So if you're inside the, the, the memory that you have, you're good. If you're outside even one element, that's, again, segmentation fault. If it's not, say, I hope that it gives you segmentation fault. If it doesn't segmentation, given segmentation, you, if it doesn't give you segmentation fault, it means it's overwriting your other pieces of memory in your program without you knowing it. Like the counter of another loop is being changed. <laughs> And you don't know. And you say, what the heck? I set the loop to three, but it's going 500. What happened? OK, because you just changed the value. OK? So I hope that it actually crashes. If it doesn't, that's one of the worst things to debug. So another thing that is very bad is memory leak, which means you create dynamic memory allocation. And after you do the allocation, without deallocating it, you do another memory allocation and put the address in the old, old old pointer. So the old pointer that you had loses that piece of memory forever. And I always mention, that's when you have to take the modem out of the thing, wait for 15 seconds, and put it back in. That's what's causing it. Because every single time it's doing a memory leak, and, it, and memory leak keeps getting more and more and more, and your memory gets smaller and smaller and smaller, down to the point that the executable cannot function anymore, and your modem hangs. <laughs> And then you go and you unplug it, count to 15, put it back in. For two weeks, you have internet again. <laughs> OK? So that's exactly what happens, right? That's why you always update that firmware of yours. OK? Those firmwares are these. They are actually fixing them. Yes? Do you have to wait 15 seconds? <laughs> that's the thing that always reminds me. Um, no. That 15 seconds is to make it foolproof. OK? <laughs> 
just pressing the reset button at the back will do wonders. <laughs> you don't need to do that. But I don't know. I don't know what is the structure of each. Maybe some of them, when you reset, it keeps the memory. It just resets the application. If that's the case, then taking it off is a good thing. And the reason they say 15 seconds is that in 15 seconds, all the capacitors inside your modem are discharged and nothing over there. So everything, it becomes a hard reboot. Okay? And that happens in all equipment. Okay? All right, and that's the memory leak I was talking about. Okay? So correct state of unused memory is always setting it to null and have the number of memory that is you're using somewhere so you know you have how many you have. And when you actually allocate the memory, you keep track of how much memory you have. Because C++ has no way of knowing how much memory is allocated. Impossible. It's your responsibility to look for it. And always delete the memory the way you allocated it. If you say it, new int square bracket something, you delete square bracket something. If you say new employee, that's it, then you delete employee, no delete square brackets. If you don't do that, if you incorrectly delete uh, a piece of memory, what happens is that it only deletes the first element and the rest is still memory leak. Okay? So when reusing memory, always make sure they are uh, uh, actually not being used. So that's why we always check with not with the, the standard thing that between all programs is that when you don't use it, when you deallocated the memory, set it to null. So later on, I can check it out, make sure it's null. It's not going to do it automatically. You have to do it yourself. Okay. You can always, following that rule, you can freely delete a piece of memory with no care. If you delete a null pointer, it simply ignores it. Okay? It only deletes a pointer with value in it. Okay? So you make sure you always keep track of new size and everything. We talked about that. Stay within the size of the memory, and life is beautiful. Resizing memory. How do you resize memory? So when you have an already existing memory, all the, all, either you want to make it small, uh, you want to shrink it or make it bigger, whichever you want to do, it doesn't make any difference. The regulations are exactly the same. You create, you create a temporary pointer, you allocate the amount of memory that you want, either smaller or bigger, you want to resize. Then you copy all the old information from the old one into the new one. Either truncate it and make it smaller, or copy it and let, let the rest to be free if you want to make it bigger. After this copying is done, now you're good to go. You can actually delete the old one. So now the old memory is deleted. Now what you need to do is to have to make, because it's all gone, that M data is not pointing to anywhere, right? Now you have to actually make that thing point to where your temporary pointer is pointing, which is going to be this, okay? So you update the size, and then you make the pointer to point to the new, newly allocated place, and after that, poof, you have a memory with new size. Anything other than this, you're going to have memory leak, okay? That's why I added the Valgrind check to all the assignments. At the end, take a look at it. It actually tells you if you have memory leak or not. OK, it says no memory leaks possible. That's good news. You have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? Valgrind, when you actually do the submitter thingy and you run it, OK? Or oh, Valgrind, I don't know how it's actually. <laughs> all right. And this is the quickest type of uh, review that I have done in uh, dynamic memory allocation and hope that uh, uh, you can bear with me on this. <clears throat> um, let me pause and tell you something. Resume. How do we copy stuff? Okay. Fastest with resources, remember that? 
When you are actually doing copying, you, when, you want to, when you have two different classes with data that are existing outside of their scope. So now as you see the data over here in classes that I have, these two classes are kept outside of the class. If I do a direct copy, what happens? If I don't, if I just say over here, B is set to A, what's going to happen? Everything from A will go to B, not the memory that, it allocated, that is allocated. Only the member-wise copy, so M data and everything is going to get copied right, to, right into that one. And therefore, what happens, all the information are going to get caught, pointing to the, uh, they're essentially going to share the same piece of memory. And therefore, you're going to have memory leak. These type of programs run perfectly right to the end. At the end, they crash. Because you think you copied. You print A, data is printed. You print B, data is printed. They both have size 7. Yes, I copied it. But as soon as the destructors kick in, the first one gets deleted, deletes the data. When the second destructor is going to get called, what do I delete? That's the crash. OK? And that's bad copying. Where in good copying, things happen a little more cautiously, which means you get the data, you set one to another, you design a copy constructor for it, or an assignment operator, whatever it's supposed to be done, and then first you delete the, 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 the target where you want to actually put the make a copy in it. First you remove all its memory, so you make sure that there is no memory leakage. Then you're going to actually create exact same amount of memory as the other one. Then you're going to do the copying one by one from the other one to this one, and everything gets copied exactly to the size. Afterwards, you update the size of the target, and life is beautiful. Now you have a good copy. And when the destructor is called, the first one is going to go, life is beautiful. And when the destructor of the other one is called, going to get called, the memory of that one is called, gone, and there is no memory leak. Are we OK with this? That was OOP244 in 30 seconds. <laughs> All right? Are we OK with this? All right, so that was when I said, I'm going to do a quick review of dynamic memory allocation. That's what I meant. Are we OK down to this point? I can drop it for you. Sure, I'll put it in a, uh, in a notes on GitHub. So it's going to go on, all in GitHub. Any questions down to here? Any questions? One? Any questions? Two? Yes, sir. Wait, 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 wait. We don't want it to be a mysterious question. Yes. Yeah, it's like the heap, the heap wire, right? It's like the heap is shared by one application or all the applications. All the stuff that you have into your computer, they all share the heap. Okay. Everything. Okay? So it's not only one. They all share the same thing. Are we okay? Any other question? Any other question? Let's have a break. There we go. So we talked about definitions and declarations. We, we, we talked about what the scope is, what is a block scope, what do, you, what do you actually create in a scope. So when you actually create something in a block that is, that is something like this, it is within the block. That's one of the dangers of, of creating stuff in a block that is, it's, it's interpreted differently in different compilers. And I strongly suggest not to do that. And if you see a code like that, immediately clarify it and fix it. If you see something like this, and I'm sure you have done it many times, for integer i set to 0 and i less than whatever, and i plus plus, and you did something, right? You have done this so many times, right? One compiler interprets this thing and compiles this in a way as you have integer i here. Which means before at line 5, i gets declared, and it is known throughout your scope to the end of the program. Another one sets it like this, where it's inside the for loop. So when for loop ends, there is no i. Because of this fact, this code is not portable. You cannot get it from one compiler and 
100% successfully compiler than another. Because if I write it like this, it's valid in one compiler and invalid in another. Because one compiler has, assumes that at line 8, the first i is gone. Therefore, you can create another one. Another one creates the i at line 5 and tries to create another i at line 8.5. And therefore, you're going to have two integer i's in the same scope, and that's a, that's a crash. That's a conflict and it won't compile it. Don't do stuff like this. It's not good for your health. Always try to do it in a way that is clear for everyone. Writing an integer before for loop won't kill you, OK? Unless you have only one function you want to write, one for loop to do something and get over with it, you know there's nothing else over there. In that case, sure. But if you're writing a big program that you know you have 50 lines of code over there and you want to write a for loop, don't do it this way. Create your counter up there, up there and reuse your counter as you're going through your coding. Class scope, we know global scope. As I mentioned, global scopes are not global the way we talk about in C language. In C language, they call a global scope when you write a, a, a variable at the top of all the functions in your, in your file. If you write something integer pi, and you write something at the top of your program, they call it global. It's not global. It's only visible to that module. If you go to another module, you won't be able to have access to it. These are not, com these are, I call it file scope. So they are actually, or module scope, you can call it. All right? So these global scopes can be enforced using the external type of uh, uh, qualifier that we'll see. So what you do, if you want to, for example, have a variable x, and you want this integer x to be the same in all your files, a truly global variable. What you do, you create integer x in one of the files, and you write external int x in all the other ones, which means one of them will create a variable called x, and the other ones are telling to the compiler, there is an x in another module. Use it. OK? We're going to go through it like that. So that's a globe. That's how C out was created. OK? We'll go through it. What is shadowing? Shadowing essentially means in an outer scope, you have a, 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 a variable created. Then you go in an inner scope, you create a variable with the same name. Different type, different thing, it doesn't matter. Because the names are the same, the inside one, the inner scope, shadows the outer scope, and it's not accessible anymore. The I over here that you see that says 4 has nothing to do with this I. There are two different things. And as soon as this if statement is gone, that i is coming back to another, to its original. OK? <clears throat> you follow what I'm saying? So again, this i that is minus 4 has nothing to do with this i. It shadows it. OK? This is what I was talking about, the external linkage. So you say this. In, I said integer x, and but this is integer share me. So this share me is in file A. In file B, you write, and that's a global variable. You put it at the top, outside of all the, all the functions. So at the top of the file, you write int share me is equal to 0. And in all the other ones, you write extern int share me. So what happens is that, and as you see, this one actually initializes it, but this one doesn't do anything. This simply tells to the compiler there is a, a, a variable, global variable, in another file called share me. Use that here. And then it becomes a true global variable. That's an external linkage. <clears throat> now, there are two different types of globals that we can actually deal with. One global variable has a global scope, which means it's visible everywhere. We call that like C out or C in. These are global objects that are, that are uh, <coughs> accept uh, uh, um, accessible everywhere. And what happens over here is that they get created, they are used, and when the program is over, they die and they go away, right? You can create a variable that 
its lifetime is global, but its accessibility is local. It's very simple to, to, to explain and demonstrate. So in here, I have the perfect loop for it, so I'm going to do it. So in here, I'm going to write over here void foo. Integer a is set to 1. And in here, I'm going to say uh, c out a. And I'm going to say c out a plus plus. Yeah. OK? If I can type it, and uh, And now in here, I'm going to say foo. What's going to happen here? When I does it? First of all, I'm going to have a compiler because I don't have a semicolon. <laughs> Secondly, now what's going to happen here? What is going to be the output of this program? Seriously. Actually, I'm going to put this thing in the quiz. Next quiz, that's where it's going to go. There we go. OK, we're saying, what is the output of this program? New? I ah, got you. You got a one. You have to uh, reflect now on it. <laughs> Seriously? Shame on all of you. Thank you. It's all ones. It's all ones, you bad people. It's all ones. It's going to keep calling the function. A is going to die. A is going to be two and it dies. And then another one. And then another one. And then it keeps going like that. But if I do this, Static int a. Now the lifetime becomes global, which means it gets created once and it never dies, which means the second time I go in it, a is going to be there. And line 4 only gets executed once, the first time the function is called. In reality, it gets called when the program starts. But let's say. OK, so when you do something like this, right when the program is getting started, that's going to get created, and one goes in it, and bye-bye. And it's always accessible in that foo. Therefore, if I run this beautiful program of mine, next time, what I'm going to see will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It won't die. It will stay over there. Hence, static variable. Are you OK with this? Are we OK? Yes. You were saying? Uh, so before making uh, A static, it? yeah, it first prints it. But what, why it prints one? Why it doesn't because print plus two? plus happens after, after the fact. Are we good with this? Now static can be used for logic too. You can make, you can make a function. If you static in a function acts like that, static in a class becomes a shared variable between all instances of that class. So for example, if you want to create a class and you want to count to see how many objects of this class is created, create a static member variable, call it CNT, and in a constructor add one to it. And in a destructor, reduce that variable by one. When it runs, every single object that gets created, because that static is shared between all objects, we're going to come into the details later on. It's going to actually uh, count how many objects you have. But static, variable, static member variables cannot get initialized in the constructor or anything. You have to separately using a scope resolution and the class. They call it actually class variables. So you have to initialize it outside. We'll come to, a, to it when. Uh, the time is just be aware of its existence. Also, you can make functions static, which means I better not talk about it. We'll talk about it later. And we don't care about these. I'll talk about it later completely. Okay? 
I have the reason that I'm not talking about it is I don't have any usage lose usage example to, to tell you what it is. When the time comes, I'm gonna explain it to you. Okay? Type theft that is, is something that is rarely used in C++. Type theft is what we use in C because we don't have types created in C++. One more time. Type def, sorry, ignore what I just said. Type def is what we use in C language because structures in C language are not types automatically. In C language, when you say struct employee, to create an instance of, an, of that employee, you have to again say struct employee A, right? In C++, when you say struct employee, then employee becomes a type. You can say employee A, employee B, so employee becomes a type. In C language, they actually did something like this. So in C language, when they created structures, they did it like this. They, first of all, let me tell you what type def is. Let me show you, show you the example over here. So in here it says, type def const int, constant int, and then constant, which means it says, abbreviate this one or tag this type as this one. So whenever I put const int together, I mean this one. It's renaming a type. You follow what I'm saying? So essentially, instead of writing const space int my constant, you can say const int constant. That's a bad example. Let me just, because they are exactly the same things, like why you do this. So let's say something like that. C int, okay? So if I do something like this, instead of saying const int, I don't know, A, is 12, I can say C int A, B 12. So B and A are of, of the same type. In C language, to fix the problem of not repeating the structure over and over and over, instead of creating, let's say, something like this, if I had a struct, struct name, and I had over here character first, 20, and character last, 30. If I had something like this, then if I wanted to create an instance out of it in a function, so if I had fa over here and I want to instantiate that, I had to say struct name n, correct? That's C language, correct? They said, okay, instead of doing this, I'm going to play a trick. I'm going to say type def name. Which means this is my type. Make it name. So instead of struct, now you can actually say name it in C language. So they, they remove that. So like when I used to do C programming long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I used to create all my structures like this. Nobody created the structure as struct name and then do it again and again and again. They did it like this because it was just easier. Okay? So that's what a type def is. And it comes in C++ from the compatibility of C language. And it can be used for many different things. Like if you want to create an integer pointer, you don't have to actually write. So, so you can actually, you can actually do, do things like this. So, so instead of an integer pointer, you can actually say type def int pointer int ptr. Right? And you can say int int ptr a. Okay, so A is now a pointer of type integer. Are we okay with this? That's just what a type def is. With type def, you can uh, give types, already existing types, new names. All right? It's not a defined statement. Don't be mistaken. 
it really gives an, it, it actually, after that, your compiler has two types with the same definition. Okay? Yes. You put it in a header file or something, and then you make sure it's, it's available to. It's exactly like you're creating a structure. Where do I put a structure? Put it in a code, put it in a header file, what do I do? Type def is something like that. You are defining a type. Yes. Wherever you define a type in your regular program, you do a type def too. Beautiful question, by the way. Thank you. The question, oh, I forgot. <clears throat> the question was, where do we put the define? In a code or in a header file? OK? In a header file. We know what namespaces are. We have created namespaces in OP244. I'm not going to waste your time with it. The only thing that's the, that is uh, good to know about is about using. We always said using namespace STD. STD, using namespace STDS, right? You can actually only make one entity of a namespace available. So you can actually say using not namespace, you can say using STD scope resolution C out. By doing that, C out becomes available to your code, but not C in. So if you want specific parts of a namespace to get accessed, uh, accessible, you can do it that way. There should be some kind of an example somewhere here. Of course, you can qualify everything. You know that. You know, you know about qualifications, though. And I want to. Yes, there you go. Using identifier. So, you, so essentially, it's a using dot leader. As you see, only leader is going to get accepted over here, available, nothing else. So if I say using STDC out, only C out will be available for my code. The rest have to be qualified. OK? But if you say, so other stuff like in STD won't be available. And the using namespace whatever brings everything inside that namespace and makes it available to you. So you say using namespace std, the string header file is going to come in here, standard library is going to come in, here, C type is going to come in here, all the stuff that you have in standard uh, 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 library is going to get uh, namespace is going to get um, accepted. I'm not going to talk about anonymous namespaces now. We'll talk about it later. Essentially, you can create a namespace with no name just to um, uh, keep the name of the variables that you have local so it doesn't affect other namespaces. You can do that, OK? So you don't want to create another namespace. You just don't want to have a conflict with the other ones. Oh, we talked about all these things. I'm not going to talk about good design, like what, how, to, header files. That you've already done that in OP244, and it's redundant if I want to talk about it. Go through it. When I say I don't talk about it, it means go study it yourself and come with questions. <laughs> okay. I just talked about these things with the memory allocation stuff, with reviewing memory allocation. What is what? Okay. So we know all these things. I don't have to go through it. You know exactly what is created where and which one is in heap and which one is not. Storage direction, uh, automatic, static, dynamic. Thread, forget about it. We'll talk about it later, OK? But I talked about what is automatic. Automatic is essentially whatever you create in a local scope, it automatically gets allocated and deallocated. Uh, statically uh, 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 is the one that. Uh, they never die. Uh, the static ones and dynamic ones are the ones that uh, they come and go uh, based on your decision. So when you create something dynamic, you can bring it to life and kill it halfway through your execution. And they're not accessible anymore. Statics, no matter what you do, they get created when the program starts executing and dies when the execution is over. They're always there. You cannot get rid of them. OK? I just gave you an example of that so you know exactly what it is. Compilation and execution, we talked about all these things. I showed you the picture and all yada yada. It's the same thing, OK? So you know exactly what it is. What is binary? What is compiler? Linker. So we went through that. Uh, 
please read this yourself and you know exactly what it is. You used it 55,000 times last semester, right? Uh, because we are using C++17, because we are using C++17, we cannot use the C++ compiler that is currently on Matrix, okay? Uh, if ma uh, the, the Linux language is very closely and tightly con uh, dependent to the compiler that is installed on it. When a rebuild of something comes in, when anything, any update comes into to, to Linux compiler, unlike Windows, that the updates are coming from Microsoft, it actually builds it on your operating system and applies it to your operating system. If you change the version of the operating system, the, the operating system won't function anymore. Because of that fact, we have to install the visual, the, 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 the C++ compiler that does uh, 17 standards in a separate directory. So you actually have to have an alias in your .bash profile created exactly how it's mentioning it over here. On matrix, go to and write this export thingy on your .bash and then read these things and apply it and write it. <coughs> so uh, when, so essentially you have to issue this command to run it. But what I did, I, so let me show you exactly how I, how I set it up, so you can set it up like that too. So you don't have to, yeah, to, to compile, you have to write this big thingy. Instead of doing this, do this. Give me two seconds. Let me log in. <clears throat> Come on, today. Open. Oh. There we go. So that's the export extension uh, thing that you saw with it. You see that? Export, yada, 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 yada. You see that? And then create an A plus, uh, alias and call it capital G++ and set it to the value that it was mentioning it over there. You see that? Therefore, anytime you say capital G++, it's going to call the other compiler. If you do lowercase g++, it will be the systems compiler. I'm going to post that one too so you know. Okay? So that's, you have to do that. On, you can actually do it right now. Like go to, to the thing. I'm going to leave in three minutes. I have to go 15 minutes early so you can spend that 15 minutes to do this. Okay? Uh, so remember, just alias equal to, and then, so the export thingy that, that you see over here, that goes to dot, dot, dot bash profile exactly what it is. So this part. Oh, come on. So this part goes to dot bash profile. And this part, you write alias, alias, G++ capital, equal to double code, and then you put the rest in there, down to here. And that compiles, that makes your compiler C++ 17. Okay? I'll post it anyway. Okay, I'll post the instructions anyway, and, and it's being recorded too, so you can just skip to the end and, and take a look at it. Any questions? So we don't need to include the submit or the submit Pardon me? Oh, we've got to put the proper thing in a submitter. So okay. submitter knows where the yeah. compiler is. Okay. Our, my submitter, the submitter that I have written, yeah. that submitter will invoke the proper C++ compiler. Yeah. And um, the submitter that I'm using, the submitter command that I use it because I wrote it is a higher version than others, so it has other options. If you believe the submitter is not good and there are parts of it that you want it to get to be changed and make do something that is more comfortable for you, let me know and I'll implement it and I add it to the submitter. Okay? Not that let us submit everything. No, I'm not gonna do that. But for example, I added the feature so it can ignore all the spaces. So it doesn't match the spaces. I added the feature that it doesn't match the lines, so you can kind of, so I'll activate those things so you can, so if you have few spaces that you cannot match and it's last minute, you can submit it without that, okay? If you just type tilde far dot slash submit, by the way, the exact same way that you did that, that I said over here, you see, I have 
F sub, Chris. See, alias F sub. You see that? So I say F sub, and it's the whole submit thingy comes up. So you don't have to type my big name every single time you want to submit something. Do that alias too. It's good for your health. OK? All right. All right? Do that. It's, it's good. Right away, you are taking a picture. Table. I, I'm going to take a pose. Is it good? Right? All right. OK, so that's that. Do those things. And uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so that's it. Um, oh, command line arguments. <laughs> that is something important, actually. All right, I guess I can't go early. OK, command line ar arguments. Let me just explain what they are. Attention, attention, take a look at it. Take a look at this for a second. So let me take, uh, actually, you don't need these things. I don't need to post this, do I? This is not something usable, is it? Oh, shoot. Uh, let me save it. Uh, garbage. <laughs> Zero one. Not CPP. <laughs> okay. Just know that that's garbage. An exception. It says, oh, why did you call it garbage, you bad boy? Okay, so. OK, my computer doesn't work. What happened? My backspace doesn't work. What's going on? Did I? OK, my backspace doesn't work for some reason. My delete doesn't work. What the devil is going on here? Uh, OK, let me see if it works over here. It works just fine. OK, it doesn't work in Visual Studio. Let me just close this and open it again. Yes, it works now. OK. Well, that was that, that, that's the first time that I've seen something like that, believe me. OK, so. So whenever you are, take a look at this, please. It's easy two-second thing that I want to tell you. Arg C. See what I'm doing? I'm going to say C out arg V I. See, no magic. I'm just going to, um, let's put the I plus one over here, too, just uh, to show you what the arguments are, or maybe I itself. So I'm going to say arg. I is this thing, okay? So I'm just, I'm just printing that message, okay? So main actually accepts three arguments. There are two of them. I'll go, I'm going to tell you what the third one is, okay? I don't think we have the third one over there. But there, there. So what happens over here, if I compile this, build solution. Uh, so... If I run this program and I compile this, and if I actually open the, let me open the uh, file location. Uh, how do I open this? It's open in File Explorer. Okay, so that's the, I just want to know the path. So that's the path, copy. Now I'm going to open the command line. CMD. Something is very strange with this thing. It jumps up and down and everything. So, so first let me go to drive D, and then I'm going to say CD, and I'm going to put that path. So that's where this solution is, OK? <clears throat> now, if I take a look at it, these are the stuff that we have in here. And there's a debug 
thing over here, right? So I'm going to go CD debug. And in there, I have 01 January 8.exe. You see that? So I'm going to say 01 January 8. And I'm going to say he he, hu hu, and ha ha. You see that? And I hit enter. Ta da! So you can actually pass command line arguments to your program using the arguments that you receive in main. In main, the number of things that exist on command line, one is the name of the executable, and two, three, four. That's argc. So your argc receives four in here. Are we okay with this? And argv is an array of strings. Okay, so it's essentially an array of pointers. The first one points to the first one. The second one points to the second one, and it keeps going. How do I debug with this thing? You go to project and project properties. And in project properties, you go to debugging and command line arguments. And I'm going to say, hello there, how are you? You see that? And I'm going to say, OK. And when I run this beautiful program of mine, now those are passed to my program as if they are executed at command line. And look at the first one. Woo, that's how it calls it. So that's the name of the executable. It puts the absolute path for it to make sure it runs it properly. And the rest are the arguments that are actually passed through it. So if you want to give command line arguments to your program to run it, that's how it works. And another thing that exists in there that I don't know why nobody ever talks about is like, it's ENV. ENV is a null terminated array of pointers, not characters. Which means each pointer is pointing to a string, and the last one points to null. So if I want to print them one by one, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say for int i set to 0, i less, no, not i less than, env i and i plus plus, which means if env i is null stop. If it's not, if it's pointing to something, keep going. And I'm going to do the exact same thing, show them one by one. But I'm going to show the env, not argv. Are we OK with that? I just did something that I was against my advice. I have two ints, so I'm going to put int i over here and remove this. Because if you take this on matrix and run it, then it won't work. That's why I took it out. OK? Now, if I run this beautiful program of mine, the first one is going to be hello, shmello thingy, and look at all the rest. Woohoo! All the stuff that all the environment variables of your system. User profile is that one. Where is that thing? Home path is user farad. Operating system is Windows NT. This is my path. This is the processor ar architecture. How many CPUs do I have? Every single thing, like what is a Windows? And you do that on Linux, it shows all the environment variables on Linux too. But again, this is just a string. If you want to know what is the environment variable, you have to go up to assignment. That's the name of the variable. Everything after the assignment is actually its uh, value. So my username is Farda. OK? Are we OK with this? That's all. The third one, I don't think it's in the notes, so it's a good thing to, to take care of it. It's not in there, is it? But it's a very useful thing. You, if you actually want to make sure that the name of the executable is not changed, you can check it out. You can check to make sure what the name of the executable is and everything. Have a beautiful day. Bye-bye. Let me stop the recording.